Very good. Right. Well, for everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, if you've got any questions tonight, we have got the chat box or the Q&A function at the bottom. And you can feel free to ask us any questions at any point. Uh, we are recording this event, so you can watch it again. It will upload onto our YouTube, um, which will be available for anyone to watch. Um, so my name is Molly, and I'm from Lancashire Wildlife Trust. I'm a Communications and Engagement Officer. And with me also is Caroline, who is our Iron Naturalist Project Officer. And we also have Ben Deed, who is the Manager of Merseyside's Local Environmental Records Centre, Merseyside Biobank and Juliet Staples, the Senior Project Manager of Urban Greedo. Now, for those of you not so familiar with the Wildlife Trust, we are a nature conservation charity and we look after over 50 wildlife sites across Lancashire, Manchester and North Merseyside. From Brockholes in Preston over to Mayor Sands Wood in Rufford and Walton Crab up in Silverdale in North Lancashire. And then in Merseyside, we've also got Lump Meadows, which is my favourite. Um, part of our work is also to help connect people with nature and encourage others to care about the natural world so that we can all protect it. Now, tonight, Julia will be presenting first, explaining the purpose of the Urban Green Project and the green installations in the Baltic Triangle. And then Caroline will be showing us a video about the biodiversity monitoring and progress of the project so far. Um, then Ben will be talking through previous wildlife sightings in the area and the value of wildlife recording. And then we'll go back to Caroline to talk us through how you can get involved. And we will be responding to any questions and comments in the chat this evening, but we will have time to answer questions at the end too. So I'll pass over to Juliet to get started. Thank you. Can I just confirm that you can see that? Yeah. Okay, so bear with me. Thank you. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about the Urban Green Act project, which is a project with um, Liverpool City Council, the Mersey Forest and the University of Liverpool. So the project's funded by an EU funding source called Horizon 2020, and there's about 14 million euros in total. And that money is shared between Liverpool as the uh, front runner UK city, Valladolid in Spain, and Ishmir in Turkey. Um, and those are the three front runner cities. And Liverpool's probably got somewhere in the region of about 40, uh, sorry, about 4 million euros. Um, and uh, I've talked about the consortium, which is, is shown there, but we have a number of global follower and network cities around the world as well. And the project focus is about to trial and monitor the retrofitting of a whole range of different types of nature based solutions into the city over a five year period. Um, we're about four years into that project now. So I'm just going to run through a number of different types of nature based solutions and some of the work that we've done. So we've done quite a lot of tree planting and there's a quick slide there just to kind of recap really on some of the many benefits of urban trees. We've done quite a lot of tree planting in soft ground, which is tends to be one of the easiest forms of pl tree planting. Um, we've planted in the front gardens of registered providers on small pieces of land. We've created a small orchard. Um, and we're looking here at kind of a whole range of environmental, social and economic benefits, including things like uh, cooling and shading for the trees, um, about identifying a sense of place, providing landmarks, and even looking at changes in how we manage the landscapes where we plant some of those trees. We've also tackled something a little bit harder, trees in hard landscapes. So the images here, on certainly the top one that shows um, a series of silver cells, uh, which are linked. Um, and these are big, big areas um, for trees, uh, tree pits, uh, and they're linked so that the roots can grow um, across and underneath the, the structures that you see there. Um, and what we've done here is on the big works in Liverpool on the, the city centre connectivity, we've got 14 uh, sustainable urban uh, drainage pits linked in the central reservation and what these do is they accept surface water flow off the carriageway so during periods of heavy rainfall the water will be channeled into the first tree in, in each of the series of pits and it will slowly run from tree pit to tree pit and as it does that 
the uh, the soil obviously gets damp, the water's held back. So we slow the flow of that excess flooding surface water. Um, the trees help to um, effectively clean and filter some of the water and the pollutants and particulates that are coming into them. And then the final discharge volume is obviously a lot cleaner and reduced. Um, and of course, they're adding things like shade and biodiversity. So this is an, uh, a demonstrator example right outside the Cunard building. And it's been good because it's, it's helped to create all sorts of discussion on climate change with some of our other partners, such as highways and drainage. We're also looking at trees for filter planting. So this is the same scheme and the green dots there show the tree planting along the strand. And we're looking here at up to 150 trees being planted along the strand. And we're on the edges there, we're looking at the filtering properties of the trees to see how effectively they help to um, reduce the transmission of airborne particulates from the vehicles. And similar tree filter planting is also happening in other sites, uh, Stafford Street and also Lime Street Station. There are some areas in the city where we just cannot get any trees into hard surfaces or pavements and container tree planting has its ups and downs, but we are looking at it again. Um, so these are going to be used in areas where we have absolutely nowhere. The underground is full of cables, communications and pipes. Um, we're going to be using them in the project example to replace some concrete bollards. So it removes a kind of an ugly street scene feature with something that's a lot greener. We're going to be integrating it with some seating as well. Um, and we've designed the containers in such a way that after three to five years, when the trees typically outgrow them, they can either be removed and replanted or removed and the containers um, can then be used for other, other planting, uh, woody shrubs or bulbs. But the idea is that we could create almost like a, a city nursery in some of these areas with these containers. And then um, our more innovative um, development was the mobile forest. And I don't know whether anyone saw this, it's a couple of summers ago now, uh, but this is a hexagonal structure as you can see from that plan view with trees inside. But what makes it different is on the inside surface of that hexagon, the walls are completely mirrored. So when you squeeze in and obviously pre COVID days on the bottom, but when you squeeze a number of people in, it is like sitting in a never ending forest. And it was a really great way to actually uh, take people out of the busy city for two minutes of reflection um, and talk to them about the benefits of trees and greening. Uh, and that was launched by Sir William Worsley. And the mobile forest is off to Chelmsford in September for a British landscape uh, meeting. Um, and it's also actually going to be uh, popping up, I think, at the Good Business Festival, but it will ultimately go to Liverpool John Moores, where it will have a permanent home in their forest school. Pollinator planting is an area that we've also looked at. We've looked at all sorts of verges and patches, and it's really about uh, attracting foraging insects um, and linking areas and changing the way that we manage the land. So we've looked at the sunny places pollinator planting, which is something that we see quite often as we drive around our cities, but we're also uh, keen to do some shady space pollinator planting as well. And pollinators obviously provide lots of biodiversity, all sorts of environmental refuges. And um, I've highlighted here that we're using them certainly in our project to help with some of the way marking of green routes and also to, for more cared for places. Some pollinator planting we've done, this is uh, the Princess Avenue scheme where we work with our colleagues in, in culture and, and highways and regeneration. And we've planted a kilometer of um, wildflowers along the length of this. And I hadn't realized, but apparently we won an award in February um, with our colleagues um, as part of a, a local um, city region award for sustainability for that project. Um, but they also we're looking at pollinator planting in some of the harder areas. So the top picture there is a very unloved piece of grass that looks like it's been mostly burnt. And I think we're just going to lift that and we're going to re repave, but with some reclaimed sets. But we're going to allow some small planting spaces in between so that it can still take a lot of traffic. Um, but hopefully we can introduce some value to that space where there is currently none. The pictures in the centre. This work's already been done. So the Royal Court Theatre drinks balcony was very kind of sparse and urban um, a couple of summers ago. And we've now all just using pots, uh, created a little pollinator roof there, along with a, a bug hotel and some other things. So much nicer area to sit and use now. And then the pictures on the right at the top, this is an area close around Wapping Dock. There's a number of these gravel areas and the slipway. And we're going to be hydro seeding um, on, on this and a number of other areas around there um, and adding other species uh, to see if we can um, make them more interesting and, and more of more value really to the city. 
One of the more innovative things we're looking at are smart pollinator pillars. So these have a solar panel on the top and a water reservoir at the bottom. And you can choose different types of planting. You can have biodiversity. You can plant for air quality with species that have sticky leaves and trap particles. Uh, and you can have um, pollinator ones with little insect homes in. The idea is to put them on things like lampposts and columns where there is um, no opportunity to do any kind of vertical or horizontal greening in the city. But by putting them on the lamppost, you can effectively introduce colour and create these bee or butterfly motorways um, and link up areas through cities as well. Um, so we hopefully have 10 of those going in that we're trialling in the next few weeks. Green walls, you've probably seen these before, these vegetated or living walls often on the outside of uh, buildings, normally big hotels, for example. Um, useful to attract foraging insects um, and they, all sorts of different types of designs and irrigation systems. So we've got two at the moment. So the top one I'll confess is my favourite. So that's the past street one. Um, I like it because it's just incredibly accessible. You can walk alongside the pavement. It has what we call discovery plants. So there are seasonal changes. Um, and then the one underneath is uh, St John's Shopping Centre. It's a little bit larger. We think it's possibly, or at one point, it might have been the longest one in the UK, but we're not 100% certain. But it's really well positioned, close to the bus station, so it's great for trapping particulates. So here we're looking at these walls providing functions around improved air quality. We've had some really promising data on thermal imaging, looking at how they reduce the temperature in a local area. And of course, biodiversity is going to be key as well. And then we've got a number of water interventions to finish with. So rain gardens are normally shallow basins that, that collect and store water, certainly during he um, heavy rain, and the plants must be able to cope with both dry and wet conditions. Water retention ponds are often more permanent pond features um, and provide additional storage for water. And floating ecosystems are normally kind of fairly self-contained. I'm just gonna have a quick look at, at those. So on the rain gardens here, I've got a couple of pictures at the top. On the left, very simple rain garden, just a, a damp area where the soil is dug and there are some, some plants. And then on the right, a more engineered one where the water flows from the pavement through the rain garden, acting a little bit like the tree suds with the soil holding the water, filtering it, and then it going out to drain. The rain garden that we're looking at in Liverpool, we haven't actually started yet. We're just in the final processes of design and commissioning because we've been delayed through COVID but it's in a very urban area. So we're looking to have some kind of design element to it. Uh, so it, it kind of fits better in the street scene, but again, really focused around local surface flooding. Water retention ponds, we've got a couple in Otters Pool. Um, on the top slides there, we've taken away that very narrow channel and widened the area and cleared it. So we've slowed the flow and can control and store water a lot more there. And at the bottom, we have persistent problems with water blocking the paths and we've now created a brand a new permanent pond that will fluctuate um, it will be full at some points and and less full at other points of the year is a natural feature uh, but it will hold those excess waters away from the path and provide a different kind of habitat and then floating ecosystems we've got two at the moment in liverpool um, the one on the left is at Wapping dock much larger it's about 63 meters squared lots of planting on the top We've got some innovative features such as the shingle shelf, and we've got quite a good lot of biodiversity on a reef structure underneath, really aimed around biodiversity and discussions around climate change in cities. And then the one on the right is its smaller sister, really, uh, much simpler, much cheaper. Um, it's about 25 meters squared. That's in Sefton Park. And that's doing more than just biodiversity. That uh, island is also located a, a, a source running into the park lake where that has a high nutrient level. So we're hoping that the reeds will take up the nutrients um, and hopefully we'll be able to control the algal blooms that, we, that that lake sometimes suffers from. So the legacies of the project really, well, we want to leave these examples across the city uh, for a whole range of partners, both our internal partners are my colleagues that work in highways and planning and regeneration the art for possible and also for external partners such as developers um, uh, and other other investors in the city we want to be able to build a business case so we are looking at the environmental the social and the economic benefits with each of those um, interventions we'll be sharing what we learn with our follower cities and with those network of cities and promoting the results and the um, information as it comes in 
And ultimately, really, we hope that then we can begin to replicate these in Liverpool and beyond and influence city and region policies. And that's me done. So um, short and quick. Um, I'm happy. Uh, my details are there. I'll leave them up just for a minute and then I'll stop sharing. Uh, but just so that if anybody wanted to ask anything specific outside of the meeting, then please just drop me a line. So thank you for that. Fab, right. I think I am going to show Stella's um, video that she's pre-recorded because she couldn't be here today with us. Um, if someone could just thumbs up when it starts playing to show me that you could hear it, that would be fab. Uh, hello, I'm Stella Shackle. I'm the data officer for Urban Green Up Project. Um, the difference that the green interventions that are projected to have made are reduced air pollutants, water pollutants and temperature contrasts in the urban environment um, and increased floral abundance, diversity and seasonality and hence an increase in biodiversity for the area, but also an aware, increased awareness and connectivity to nature. So I'm focusing on the biodiversity monitoring and this is based on a the baseline data with the phase one habitat survey um, and liaising with Biobank, um, the local record center. Um, so trying to use all the data possible. And I just like to stress here that because, unfortunately because of the epidemic pandemic that lots of the interventions have gone in later than planned. And so there's, they haven't gone in all at once. There's been um, a gradual increase in the interventions. So unfortunately for a lot of the data, um, especially um, for the pollinators, we don't have a full season's worth of data um, there to really compare with the previous year's data. So this is all very preliminary data and just suggested what might might be um, shown um, by the introduction of the interventions. So for the biodiversity service, we standardise them um, just the summer months, um, set for some bulb areas, weekdays, dry, um, not very much wind and preferably sunny um, and also standardized air temperature. So this is all to make the um, data as comparable as possible um, to be able to uh, for the analyses. So um, looking at the insectivore um, transects um, for the dragonflies, um, we use close focus binoculars and every month and it was basically just slowly walking for a transect and starting in Prince's Park, this is in South Liverpool, um, Sefton Park, and then down to Ottersport, and then sort of doing the other direction. So basically changing the directions every month and basically trying to observe what's there and stopping at regular stopping points. And also observing when overposition happened and the diversity of species. So this is showing the abundance that we found throughout the years, um, a lot of um, as you've blue damselflies, um, but a whole range of different species. And it seems to vary between years and what's there. So this is looking at, at our preliminary data, sort of pre and post um, the interventions going in. Um, the interventions in this area are all installed in June. Um, so as Juliet will say, or um, has said that the floating island in this section in the lake and then in, in the Ottersport area, the two um, suds ponds. So, and quite interestingly, so there's, there's different variety. It's very weather dependent, this data, but there is an increase in Ottersport, um for some for some species. Um, and that could well be because there's more habitats provided in Ottersport, but we'll find out with later data. So the bat transect, this is using a GPS enabled um, monitor. Um, and whenever, because it records sound files, whenever we, bats are visually observed or heard through the detector, tend to stop and just check that you get some nice clean sound files because it makes it a lot easier to interpret them um, and find out what's there. But of course, if there's multiple bats, it makes it difficult anyway. Um, and we shortened this transect um, due to the pandemic last year 
just to highlight the main interventions and we'll actually carry on doing that now as well. So this, but this is showing the original transects, the town centre section, the Baltic section, and then going along Princess Avenue, Princess Park, Sefton Park, and down through Otterspool Woods. So back passes, I, I, a lot, it's very difficult to tell the actual number of bats because they circle around all the time and you can visually um, note that down, but it's very difficult to tell. So we look at the number of bat passes um, and this is just showing the numbers here and obviously a lot more within Ottersport area, uh, but we've also seen some within the Baltic and Bid areas. And the diverse, diversity of species observed, um, primarily soprano pipistrels, um, pipistrels pignoneus, um, but a whole range of other species. And this is picked out from the sand files. Um, seems to be a slight reduction in 2020, but it could be um, just because of the site, the, the weather at the time. But this will be told from later, more data and later analyses. So for the pollinator and floral data, um, this is based on established flower insect timed count um, developed by the Center of Ecology and Hydrology um, using a one square meter quadrat, 10, meter obser 10 minute observational counts and once a month and data collected on the floral abundance, the number of flowers, the diversity, so the range of species, but also the percentage cover within the tra transect um, and the pollinator abundance and diversity and using assigned pollinator group groupings. Um, for the pollinators and then also the local climatic data because it varies so much according to the local weather data. And then sampling locations um, with the based on the interventions or the nature-based solutions, but then a control within 100 meters, but also wider area um, samples just to see what the baseline is, what what is around, what what could be um, could be attracted to the interventions. Um, and obviously, as we're collecting more data, all these analyses are focused on the interventions. So looking at the floral data, um, this is the floral abundance over time um, through the years. So it's very much showing there's quite high numbers of flowers throughout the whole different sites. And it, it varies, it's, it is varying a little bit, but um, we're, um, it was told with time over data, uh, with more data. And this is just showing the diversity of plant, fa plant families um, that we've observed so far, primarily Asteraceae, um, but also Fabiaceae, which are the clover family. And, but I've also included grasses in here, Poaceae, um, because that's within the percentage cover that we're noting, um, but we're not, not using, noting the number of flowers for in terms for the pollinators for that. Oops. Um, looking for the looking at the pollinator data, um, and this is looking at pre and post um, pollinator abundance um, for the different pollinator groupings. And as you can see from left to right, the hoverflies have increased for each site. Um, sorry, the sites are green for Otterspool, um, orange for Baltic, and blue for for Bid. Um, also increased for the bumblebees. Um, a little bit in, slightly increased for the solitary bees, but dramatically increased for the honeybees. Um, and it'd be interesting to have some data on the number of honeybee hives, whether it's actually increased within Liverpool, whether that explains that. So looking at the, and if we're separating out the honeybees, they're just sort of showing the other orders have also increased and, and are also important for the pollinate, for pollination. Other hymenoptera includes, of course, solitary bees, bumblebees and wasps. Dipter also includes hoverflies, which is also an important pollinator. So in general, most pollinators have increased in time, especially honeybees, um, but all the data is very weather dependent, particularly for the insectivores. Um, and as I've stressed, it's that this is only preliminary post-intervention data so far, and we're collecting more data and we're, we're, conclusions are yet to be determined. So um, please use iNaturalist to record any biodiversity in the area and follow us and please email any questions to me on this email here and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Awesome. Right, there we go. Fab. Well, that was fantastic. I definitely learned a lot. Um, um, and I'll pass over to Ben now to talk a little bit more about what's been cited in the city centre and Baltic area.
Okay, so just give me a second to share my screen here. <clears throat> working yeah <laughs> okay so uh i'm ben deed i'm from merseyside biobank which is the local environmental record center for uh north merseyside so we've been if you don't already know the background to this we were brought on uh by dr juliet staples alongside the lanx wildlife trust um relatively recently um to start working um on the project to to help support the project through the use of iNaturalists. so that's engaging people in wildlife recording uh, around the green interventions to see what we can find out and about the impact on biodiversity from that citizen science angle. Um, and also to get people a bit more engaged uh, with, with these interventions and what, what's going on. Um, so first of all, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context about Biobank and, and kind of what we do here. Um, so Biobank has one full-time member of staff, myself, um, but since last year, just last year, we now have two one-fifths of a person um, <laughs> who, are, who are here to support. Um, but the important thing about this slide is, is kind of what I want to get across is how, how important it is that, um, for volunteers uh, to, to, to engage us. I mean, we absolutely need volunteers um, for, for everything we do. And I hope you'll come to see all the kind of stuff we do and hope to realize how important that is uh, as I continue through the uh, presentation. So, I mean, we have, a relatively small amount of volunteers in the office itself that help us with uh, computer tasks, data tasks, capturing things like habitat data. Um, but much more broadly, there's at least 300 uh, regularly recording uh, volunteers out in North Merseyside. There's actually probably a lot more than that, um, either engaging with us directly um, through various um, kind of uh, recording websites or indirectly through the uh, local natural history groups or uh, national schemes and societies. Um, so there's a whole host of recording projects out there that we're tapped into um, where we have these ex exchanges of uh, wildlife data. Um, so Biobank itself, we are one organization, obviously we sit here managing data, um, but our job is to collate the information of a whole host of organizations that exist out there and also to share that information with many, many others as well. Um, so just to give you a bit of the context of the data. So this is us on the right hand side of the screen, I hope you hear. Um, that's our area, that small bit from Southport into Liverpool. So we cover Sefton, Liverpool, Nosley and St Helens. Um, and our remit really is the local collation of data uh, to be able to provide local services. So that's so it really is about benefiting local biodiversity. That's what we exist to do. I mean, if, if it wasn't lo about the local stuff, we wouldn't need to be here. So other record centers like us exist right across the country. Um, but so this is our focus. But we are tapped into this much wider network. So with just within um, just our local area, even we are part of something called Merseyside Environmental Advisory Service. Um, so the data that we collect, they can then use to advise on things like city region strategy. Um, for each of the districts um, and also kind of targeting conservation effort as well and helping to put in place um, policies at that city region scale that then influence conservation and biodiversity much more widely. Beyond that, we then work with other Northwest England uh, record centres. So the likes of even Cumbria Wildlife, no, Cumbria Wildlife, Cum Cumbria Record Centre, uh, Learn, Great Manchester and Cheshire. Uh, to enable things like um, Northwest England strategy. A, th a few years ago now, there was a Northwest biodiversity audit. So the information we're using is helping to advise those kind of things. Again, much further than that, we're also a node of the National Biodiversity Network. Um, so via them, uh, we can the data that we share is used to influence things like national policy. Um, things like, uh, which I'll come to actually later, things like the UK-wide uh, State of Nature report. Uh, and also beyond that, again, the National Biodiversity Network is, is feeds into the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, um, which in turn uh, shares data for, for use in things like international research uh, and things like deciding which species should be on those um, international conservation priority lists. So from this very local level, data has, can have an enormous impact. And bearing in mind, it's not just one impact, data is there to be reused um, into the future as well. 
Um, so bringing it back down for a second here before I get carried away. Um, this is uh, Liverpool. So we're talking about the uh, Baltic Triangle and the interventions that are happening here. On the map on the right hand side, uh, you have that little red area. That's our focus area for the, of this particular project. So the Baltic Triangle. The squares, uh, as you can see, there's something I've produced today based on uh, data from the last decade. So this is 10 years worth of data. Um, and this is these are speeches risk richness per kilometre square. So what you can see there, uh, each of those squares has been totaled up. So the total number of species occurring within that kilometre square to give you gives you an idea of kind of the density of species based on the data that we hold. And that's the important thing. These kind of maps and this kind of analysis are only as good as the data we have. So thinking back again, you know, that data has come from volunteers and that's why this becomes so important. And I hope just bear that in mind as, as we do go through. So when people talk initially about Liverpool, they might think, oh, well, Liverpool, it's an urban area. There's no wildlife there. In fact, people have <laughs> said exactly that to me when we've tried to talk to them about this kind of stuff in the past. Um, but that's simply not true. Um, Liverpool is fantastically diverse, uh, especially for an urban area like this. And we've got well well established parks and green spaces throughout the region. We've got coastal areas, um, the, the Garston speak uh, coastal area. Um, you've got the edge of the Mersey estuary, um, and then to, towards the fringes, you've got these um, areas of green space as well. Um, and they do hold a great variety of life. I mean, if you look at some of those squares and the numbers, the key up in the top right, you see some of these squares are running to well over a thousand species. And that's based on just the things that people have been able to share with us and that have been able to identify in the last decade. Um, so it is, has been quite limited. The other thing I did want to point out with this map is actually the, the kind of wider context of the Baltic Triangle and Liverpool. Um, so you can see a lot of the darker red areas, these more, based on the data, more biodiverse areas, are those green spaces, spaces and are around that fringe area. And as you come into more central Liverpool, the more densely populated, more urbanised areas, you can see it goes much more pale. And actually the number of species per kilometre square drops off quite dramatically. And we're down to them for most of those between 100, 150 species, which actually is quite low. That is may well be in part due to um, things like recording efforts, um, the ability of people to be able to identify the species that they're seeing. Um, so, so we do have to consider that, but also an aspect of that is going to be because there aren't the opportunities to, for life to exist in those places because of the, the urban density. And that's where we link back to things like the green interventions where you've, we're putting in things for biodiversity. So creating opportunities for life to move in to, to colonise areas. There's absolutely no reason, realistically, why they couldn't be there if the conditions exist for them to do that. So that's, the, that's something we want to be able to show with data. And we want people like yourselves, hopefully listening to this, to go out and, and take a look at and, and help us uh, to figure out. Just moving on. So, so this is, again, is, is Liverpool more broadly. So Liverpool as a whole, um, based on the data we have, there's, there's what, nearly 6,000 species have been recorded. Uh, or observed, I should say, within the Liverpool area. 130 of those are conservation priority species, so they exist on lists that which have been formally recognised for species that are important to us uh, for conservation purposes. And there's just a, a selection of those broad taxonomic groups of the kind of things uh, that have been seen uh, within the Liverpool area, just to give you a feel. Um, actually, when I produce this, I'm quite surprised at how high the fungi is. I think we've probably got some fungal experts in Liverpool that have been out to a few of the parks. In fact, I know, I know that we do. Um, but yeah, a, a, a thousand species of fungi uh, just in, in this urban area, over, well over a thousand species of flowering plant, 800 moths, you know, 600 beetles, even the spiders, 180 spy, different types of spiders in Liverpool have been recorded. Um, I, think that, well, I find that kind of thing fascinating. But just on the, um, on the right here, I also wanted to share these maps. So again, in the context of the Baltic Triangle, the one on the far right hand, so that Ashy, Ashy Mining Bee, so those squares indicate where Ashy Mining Bee has been reported. Um, now this is, I mean, this is quite a prolific pollinator. It occurs quite readily, even in urban areas uh, where opportunities exist. So there's a good chance it is more widely spread within the Liverpool area, um, but we just don't know because we don't, we probably don't have the data. This is one that's probably under-recorded, 
but it's also something that you could ID from a photo. So it's just at the top there, all you need is a picture. It's quite distinctive. It's a relatively small bee that has this kind of gray fur coat on it. Um, so that's something with iNaturalist. In fact, that photo is from iNaturalist. You could just take a picture, upload it onto there, uh, and people can help, even if you didn't know and you thought it was quite interesting, somebody can help tell you what it is, which I think is quite cool. The one next to that is obviously a bat. So this again is a picture on our iNaturalist from a Proxy of Park Volunteers group. Um, this is probably a nocturnal bat, uh, which was seen again, I think just outside of Liverpool actually, it's a little bit cheeky, but it's a nice photo. Um, and again, that the picture above is a map of uh, all the bat species that we have data for uh, in the Liverpool area. The darker blue areas are the, uh, again, it's on species richness. Uh, so where we know there are more bats, um, the, the pale areas are maybe one or two species. So again, you can see the, the fairly well dis distributed and uh, we've got a fair amount of data, but they're concentrated in those green areas. If you're wondering what the dark area is next to Baltic, the Baltic Triangle, that's the cathedral. Um, so there have been some bat surveys around there, so which have picked up on a, a quite a wide range of, of species in the past, which is why we have the data there. Um, but again, it's all about having the data and getting people out um, to help help detect these species. So just focusing down a bit more into the, into the Baltic, the um, image on the top is, is our quite pathetic data holdings for the Baltic Triangle prior to the Urban Green Up project. And this is the important thing I want to get across. It's not necessarily about absence of species, it's also about recording effort. So you can see the blue dots, those are individual observations. So for that red area, the Baltic Triangle area, we had just 28 observations of any spe species in that area, which considering the diversity we know is out there, you know, it is quite poor. Um, but it also, I hope, I see you underpins uh, the absolute knowledge gap uh, for some of these urban areas. Where we're providing services, it's around targeting conservation efforts, it's around protecting biodiversity and highlighting the important areas for biodiversity. And if we don't have the data, we simply can't do that properly. So the map below um, is, is just this first year that we've been involved in the Urban Green Up project. Uh, and already you can see there's far more dots on that map. And that represents uh, almost 200 species and over 500 observations in just one year, whereas all the previous decades, we've had 28 observations. So it's a massive change. As soon as people start paying a bit of attention and start looking at areas, we find things. And I, I think that's really important. So just carry on. So a little bit more about how we're using people's observations, citizen science data. Um, just in the last year alone, because I wanted to try and um, retain that angle of when we've been accessing Baltic Triangle uh, iNaturalist data, um, there have been 150 uh, inter international research papers published using biobank data that we shared, some of which will have been uh, via this project. So if people have contributed to this project, they've also contributed to over 150 research papers. These are scientific research papers. Over 138 uh, information requests in just the Liverpool area in just the last year, 65 of those related to development control process. So this is where we're influencing things like uh, commercial developments. We're, we're helping to inform them how they can be done better for biodiversity or raising up uh, risks uh, where there might be um, a risk to, to a local uh, conservation priority species where they need to be considered as part of the planning process. So there's been 65 of those in the last year, just in Liverpool alone. Via the National Biodiversity Network, which I mentioned, so this is that wider partnership, there's been almost 3,000 data requests via that. So that can include things from the statutory agencies, Natural England, it can include, um, it can it actually does include things like development requests as well, but also conservation organisations, conservation charities are also accessing those data to help them deliver and target their own conservation action projects as well. So the reach here, I hope you're starting to see, is, is quite massive. Um, and as well as that, I mean, that's just from Biobank, but also we share data with the likes of NEAS, who I mentioned, who then go on to advise uh, the city region partnerships and the local planning authorities. Our data is used by Natural England and the Environment Agency to help advise their work. So if they're walking on, well, working on a canal or, or the docks, perhaps, um, Joint Nature Conservation Committee, 
And the image I've got on the side here is of the State of Nature report, which actually influenced government um, and helped to direct things like their biodiversity targets. The data we share is also used in that. So you're not just influencing, you know, it's not just, but it is, <laughs> it is about the local importance. Um, and again, things so we are at the cutting edge really um, of biodiversity and conservation here. Um, but the reach is so much more as well. And it's, it's not just a one-off. Um, so if we are, we're asking you to get out and record, and I know Caroline's going to talk to you a bit about iNaturalist after me. Um, and one, but one of the main questions I always get asked is, is what should I record? Um, and really, it is, it is kind of down to you, you know, because if we tell you to go and record just a certain species or at just a certain place, to be honest, you might do it for a little while, but you'll probably get a bit bored quite quickly. Um, the important thing, if you really want to contribute, is that you keep doing it because it is about that involvement and that, that continuing effort and really taking ownership and interest in the wildlife that's around you. Um, so really, it's about recording what's interesting to you. If you're into wildlife, go and look for the things that you're interested in. The, the difference is you then tell us about it afterwards. So you submit a record, submit a photo. Um, iNaturalist makes it so easy to do. Um, and you are then automatically contributing to all this other stuff as well. Uh, and that, that really is the wonder of, of biology recording, of wildlife recording. Um, is that you can contribute that easily um, and, and we'll do the rest you know we'll, we'll help to, we'll use the data through the services to to do all the technical IT stuff um, but we need you to be our eyes in the field we need you to show us uh, what you're seeing um, so there you go and um, so yeah if you're worried about recording common things this is a slightly old now example of uh, some data for uh, moles you know we just have none and the issue we have if we have little data is we don't know are they generally in danger locally or are people just not telling us when they're seeing them so i hope that's a bit of an example just you know if you're worried about sending us a picture of a frog or a picture of a butterfly chances are nobody else has done it um, so yeah please do you know go out and visit the green interventions have a look to see what's visiting them because you know the more people who do it the better Right, I'm going to leave it at that because I know I'm rambling now. <laughs> Any questions, please, please do drop them into the, um, the chat there. That was great, Ben. That was a really detailed and passionate um, explanation as to why it is important to get involved in wildlife recording. Um, and it makes me think about how uh, when I started my role at the Wildlife Trust, there was something like one sighting of a gull in all of the Baltic Triangle, which obviously could make it sound like there aren't any gulls in Liverpool. Um, which obviously would be a misrepresentation of the truth. <laughs> um, right, I will just put up my PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to keep it fairly brief because I think most of mine has been covered. But hello, I'm Caroline um, and my role is iNaturalist Project Officer at the Wildlife Trust. Um, and I'm a, a like Ben, more recent um, involvement in the Urban Greenup Project. Um, and I'm specifically here to talk about how to use iNaturalist and why we've chosen iNaturalist um, as the application that we're asking you to submit your photographs and audio recordings of wildlife in Liverpool city centre. Um, so, but before I begin, I want to watch this quick video with you um, about how to use iNaturalist and what iNaturalist is. Um, apologies if, of course, you've used iNaturalist before. Um, you might have used it in City Nature Challenge, which happened recently over the first Maybank holiday. Um, but if you are an absolute iNaturalist whiz, there's some great photographs on here to enjoy as we watch anyway. Okay, so you've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus, can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit Next if it looks good. To identify it, hit What did you see? If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation details screen, you can add more photos of the same organism 
or write a note. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geoprivacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. So there we go, a bit of a quick overview of how to use iNaturalist and what it's used for. Um, I hope you managed to take away from that that it's a free phone application um, that can be used on any smartphone. I and mean, it's really simple to use. Um, you can just take photographs like it said on the video or audio recordings, like I said, when you just come across whatever wildlife you come across. Um, ben made a really good point about how you don't have to record everything that you see. It could be that you just record what's interesting to you, um, or it could be perhaps that you want to take a photograph of a species that you see all the time, but are not quite sure what it is. Um, it's a really good app for multiple purposes, but um, many uses for it. It gives real time data and the location of where you've seen this wildlife. And that's the really important thing in terms of us gathering more information about Liverpool city centre is that um, your photographs or recordings and observations have a clear location. So we know where you spotted that um, species, plant, creature, whatever it is. Um, and the real perk of iNaturalist is that it's easy to identify what you have found because it has identification software kind of built in the application so no longer is there the problem of having to be an expert at identifying a particular species um, you can be a complete novice you can be a gardener you can be an expert it doesn't matter with our naturalist um, because the suggestions that it gives you are quite accurate um, it is an international app, so sometimes the suggestions um, might be inappropriate, but um, if you're not sure what you've found, you can always just pick the top one and someone on the in the community will change it, or you can leave it blank if you're not sure what it is, um, and you can find out what it is when uh, someone on iNaturalist informs you later. So it is a community-based application and other users can see what you've photographed or recorded um, and can add their own comments to it to help you work out what it is. On the screen here, I've got some pictures of uh, records that I've made within the Baltic Triangle um, and I just wanted to highlight like Ben has that a lot of these are really common species so dandelions for example you can see everywhere um, but to that day I was really inspired by how perfectly um, spherical it looked so I took a photo and added it to iNaturalist. Um, there's also some surprising things so mint again as I walked through the Baltic Triangle there's these planters and someone there was mint just growing in all of it because if you have mint in your own garden you know or might regret having done that of course because it spreads so quickly um but there's lots of things that you can find in the baltic triangle that you might not even expect and um like blue mussels down near whapping dock that are really fun to photograph um and there's butterfly bushes everywhere which i understand are a weed and i've always walked past them and never known them from a dandelion so that's one thing that i've learned using iNaturalist and would encourage you to take advantage of the identification software for that purpose too. Um, and I just wanted to say again that the reason we're using iNaturalist is not just its ease of use and the fact it's free, but it has the location software that means it easily creates a database of individual people's sightings. So we, um, this is done through the project function and we have a project on iNaturalist where you can actually view what has already been observed if you are curious to. It's called Urban Green at Baltic Triangle and you can just search that on iNaturalist if you'd like to have a look. Um, but like Ben mentioned, we have over 500 observations now, um, but they do come from about 13 observers. So if everybody attending this webinar were to take 10 photographs of something in the center of Liverpool, imagine how that number could increase by August. It really does matter to be committed to just spotting wildlife and taking photographs of it is a really simple thing to get involved in but um yeah yeah you just got to commit yourself i suppose but um the more that we know like ben said the more we can use that information for national projects local projects we can justify um 
funding for all kinds of things. If we see that there is a need for it or the biodiversity of the area perhaps is changing as a result of these interventions that Stella and Juliet described so wonderfully. So it will be interesting to see with more effort and more records what actually um, is happening in the city centre for wildlife. Um, and I'm just going to finish on talking about the upcoming events that the Wildlife Trust are heading for wildlife recording in the city centre, because again, we want to promote it and we want to do it as a bit of a community effort as well. Um, so, so far, the national restrictions have meant that most of the events have been self-guided or have happened online, like this webinar. Um, but hopefully by July and August, we're going to have some in-person events coming up. But in June, we've got the Heavy Gardening Art Trail that was premiered on Light Night and features seven or eight sculptures that are nature inspired and also can serve as habitat locations for different species. Um, and again, you can find that with a quick Google search um, or on, by typing heavy gardening into the Lancashire Wildlife Trust page. There should be some information there. Um, so that's something you can do and take photographs of wildlife as you follow it. We've got 30 Days Wild coming up, which is a national UK nature challenge that the Wildlife Trust organised. And this year we're kind of encouraging people in Merseyside that some of their random acts of wildness over this period might be to photograph insects for National Insect Week. It might be to um, go on a walk and upload um, an audio recording of the bird song that you hear. Um, so we're going to be promoting that on our Facebook page as well. And for children in years four, five and six, we've got the Baltic Bingo Wildlife Competition that is running through June, to, which is part wildlife spotting challenge and part iNaturalist uh, recording effort. So you can find all those details of that on our website. And if you do have children in years four, five and six, I would definitely encourage them to take part, maybe even over half term. Um, and as I said, in July, we're going to be running some in-person wildlife recording walks, we're gonna have some iron naturalist treasure hunts, and we're hoping to also have events like dock dipping and bat walks going on too, but you can keep updated um, with regard to those on the Lancashire Wildlife Trust website, um, and we'll also see them advertised on our Facebook page. Um, but if you have any questions about using iNaturalist at all, please put them in the Q&A box um, so I can answer them um, shortly, but I hope I think that's everything. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone. That's all really interesting. Um, particularly when you said then about, um, you know, like don't be put off by what other people think when you're wildlife recording. Reminded me of when I've been out um, with a bat detector and someone's approached me and asked me if I would go hunting. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. No, did I mean... you say yes? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's exactly it, though. If you're interested in something to do with wildlife, then go, then go and explore it. Mm. Why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. You can, um, I think, you can um, you can win people over as well, where they, they sometimes might think, like, I don't want to do this, and then they have a go at it themselves, and they, they see that they find something, and they're like, actually, it's quite fun, this, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, and, and I suppose the other thing is that, that I didn't mention, in fact, is that there are so many natural history groups out there. What that early slide? I mean, Liverpool itself has a fantastic culture of natural history and biodiversity going back, well, before the 1700s. You know, it's this isn't something new and geeky that's just come around. It's actually been going on for well, over 100 years. Um, and Liverpool has a fantastic culture. I mean, we've got the, the World Museum based right here. Um, and it's got the whole natural history department and has massive collections and there's so many groups that you can go out and, and join and everyone's really friendly and you can go along and learn and you know there's no one's going to force you to do anything it's, it's, it's there and you can just experience see what it's like see if you're interested a lot of people like to do it themselves and maybe join an online group and just just chat to other like-minded people the other great thing about iNaturalist is it does have this online community so you don't just upload a photo and hope for the best. I mean, there are people there that you can chat to and will help you identify the species. So it is, it's all about this learning experience as well. It's not just data. It's about your personal experience and your, your personal interest as well. Okay, um, I have a question actually for um, Juliet, if you don't mind. Are you saying about the... Um, 
putting in the, the street trees. I was just wondering um what people's like response to that has been, if you've had any like public feedback about that. Um at all um, in the we, we have. We've, well, p most people like to see trees going in. Um, there are a few occasions where the trees may be in the wrong place or it's causing a nuisance, but we do quite a lot of consultation before. Um, and I should probably have said as part of the presentation, but 10 minutes isn't very long, that we haven't plonked those things in just kind of willy nilly. We've uh, They're based on GIS information that highlight areas that are particularly prone to surface water flooding or particularly prone to um, heat island effect or whatever it might be. So the interventions have been placed in locations where they're, they're best served. So the trees are often directly addressing a problem that the people are experiencing. Um, the main tranche of trees have gone in on the strand. And I think what people haven't liked about that is all the traffic commotion that's gone on uh, hand in hand with it. Um, Cause it's works that have continued over a period of time now. Uh, but by and large, I think most people, you know, welcome having trees. And I think we're very careful now to choose the right type of tree for the right location, something that's obviously going to survive, but also something that's not going to grow too big or create problems or have overhanging branches. Um, and sometimes that can be quite a restriction on what we choose. Um, but yeah, I think the feedback's been good. And we will be actually getting more quantifiable feedback because part of the university's role will be to undertake a number of surveys and questionnaires uh, about um, in the areas of nature-based solutions to see what people think and what they feel and that that work is hopefully going to happen as soon as restrictions lift. Oh, we've had a question it says can you record things on iNaturalist without taking a photo? I have a hedgehog vis visiting but I'll never get a photo. <laughs> um, yes, you you can record things without a photograph. You they're just classed as a casual observation. Um, if you were to get a photo of it, that would be fantastic. But by no means do you absolutely have to have one if your hedgehog is particularly speedy. <laughs> yeah, can I can I just add to that with um, a wildlife recording? If you can't evidence your sighting with uh, an audio recording or a photo, don't forget you can provide a description as well. I mean, so so if you were worried that somebody might not believe you've seen a hedgehog, then you can describe the hedgehog that you've seen, and, <laughs> and that that will help to support your um your observation as well. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Someone has asked about the trees going in. Are the trees native trees? Trees that have gone in on. The they've gone in on the strand um, have been carefully selected. They're dawn redwoods and they're chosen specifically because they like to keep their roots moist. And so they're gonna be very good at actually surviving in uh, waterlogged soil um, and growing quite well. Uh, but no, we, we, we've used natural species in a lot of the locations and a lot of the projects, but um, we are actually looking at the impacts on climate change. So we are actually testing species that aren't necessarily native or naturally occurring in this country as a way to extend the pollinator season and address some of the impacts of climate change. So that does form part of the projects as well. Um, Patrick has asked, is, uh, he says, we have initiated an ecology team at Chilwell Golf Club and have collect collated information about beds, fungi trees, etc. on the course. I'm wondering if this information would be of use to you. I'm guessing that one's for you, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, particularly uh, private sites. I mean, I've talked about a lot of our, our data does come from the volunteer community and typically people will go to places they either like or that they can easily access. Um, so uh, recorded bias quite often revolves around uh, publicly accessible green spaces. So places like golf clubs um, certainly other, and other privately owned sites are, um, yeah, any, are kind of deficient in data, if you will. So if there's a group around that that's interested in recording wildlife, uh, we're absolutely interested in, in the data, uh, drop me an email. I mean, depending how you're already collect, collecting that information, you may want uh, not want to upload it all to iNaturalist, you might have a system you already use. So yeah, just get in touch and, and let me know. Uh, Molly, can you share out my email or something after this? <laughs> um, I have a question as well about um, 
the location that we've chosen for the wildlife recording. So I, I imagine that perhaps people would want to know why we're focusing just on the Baltic Triangle, because we, you and I, Ben, have said that quite a lot. Um, but we are, in fact, also including places like Wapping Dock and then further up from the Baltic Triangle, like Bold Street and Par Street. Um, so I just wanted to preempt anyone asking a question about why we're focusing specifically on the Baltic Triangle area. And we're using that kind of term as a catch all for an extended portion of the city center. Um, would you agree with that description, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I've kind of mentioned earlier, I think Baltic, um, it is important to focus down on Baltic um, mm -hmm. because we're, actually we're deficient in information in that area. Um, which happens to coincide with all the green interventions and work that's been done there, um, which is that kind of, you know, that, that's why we're looking at this particular area. We, we're low on, low on information, we're low on knowledge, mm. um, and these interventions are going in. So we want to know how that's going to impact on biodiversity in that local area. Um, but yeah, certainly away from that, uh, I mean, Biobank covers the whole North Merseyside, so <laughs> we're, we're interested in data from everywhere. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we're certainly within Liverpool as well. You know, Juliet's already mentioned they're not just doing green interventions in those areas. So there's other places. Stella was talking about her transect uh, through Princess Park, Sefton Park, and to Ottersbury. You know, there's some really nice places there that I'd encourage people if you certainly haven't visited them before, go and have a look, see what the interventions are doing, see if you can spot some dragonflies or some butterflies. Um, absolutely. Caroline, I wonder if it's also just worth saying that we've talked about the Baltic mainly this evening, but there are three demonstration areas for the Urban Green Up project, and they were determined largely by the criteria of the funding bid. So, you know, we people often say, oh, why didn't you do Kirkdale? Why didn't you do? But, you know, we were very much limited by what the, the, the criteria was to actually access the funding. I always believe it's better to take mm -hmm. it and have something than nothing, really, and to hopefully replicate what we're doing in the city centre into some of those other um, areas uh, in the future. But the reason we're focusing primarily on the Baltic is the iNaturalist was a very small element of the overall funding bid um, and the Baltic provides a perfect opportunity because you go from directly from the, the coastal uh, and the docks at Wapping right up through very mixed stakeholders. You've got uh, light industry, you've got sheltered housing, you've got schools, you've got a church, you've got businesses, you've got retail, all in a very very small area. Um, so in some ways it's a great way for us to use something like iNaturalist to hopefully engage lots of different communities and lots of different people um, in understanding what's on their doorstep and helping to record it. So it's very much a trial and we're hoping that the kind of work that, that Ben and the Lancashire Wildlife Trust are, do, are doing for us will ultimately provide a template for us to then use on the other green corridors as well. Brilliant, right. Thank you everyone. Um, well, it's just gone full past seven now, so if there's no more questions, then I think we'll leave it there. But thank you very much, everybody, for um, attending. And thank you to Juliet, Ben and Caroline for your brilliant presentation. Sounds like a fantastic project. And I'll definitely get down and um, start recording. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Welcome, Rose. I'll put my email in the chat so if you've got any questions um, that you'd like to follow up and ask the panelists, then um, send me an email and I'll get back to you. All right. Have a lovely rest of your evening, everybody. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Right. Bye.